I address a group like this, I can have as much ministry among you as you will allow me. So one of the things I like to do in a moment like this is take just a few minutes to give you a little bit of my backstory, build a little bit of relational trust with you. I know I, I sit in this seat and you're, you're seat quite a bit and someone will come in and you say, oh, I don't know who this person is. I want to take a couple minutes to tell you my backstory with Jesus. Is that all right? To tell you what Jesus has done. I, when I introduce myself in a moment like this, I tell people that the very last thing I ever thought I would be when I was growing up was a follower of Jesus. I come from the kind of family that we talk about in our churches all the time. I come from the kind of family that we call unchurched. Uh, mom and dad, really fantastic people. They loved me. They gave me the best of everything they could give me. But mom and dad did not know Jesus when I was growing up. See, the only hope that mom and dad could offer to me was hope in me. Now, I don't know if you've ever lived with hope and nothing past you. Anyone live with hope and nothing past you at any time in your life? I know that live, living with hope and nothing past Stephanie led me to what I found to be really a trap or a pit of some pretty deep, deep disillusionment, crazy loneliness, and for me, paralyzing fear. When I was 18 years old, if you had asked me what the gospel was, I honestly, I don't think I could have told you. Like, I grew up in the States. I mean, I grew up in L.A. I know L.A. is dark, but I mean, you'd think somewhere in 18 years you'd bump into somebody who knew Jesus, you know? Four years of high school, if, if, if anybody in my high school knew Jesus, nobody was talking about him. Four years in high school, I literally don't remember meeting one Christian. If anybody knew Jesus, nobody was talking about him. So I come in, I'm 18 years old, I'm graduating from high school, getting ready to go to college. If you'd asked me what the gospel was, I could have said, it has something to do with God. But when I go away to college, I tell people all the time that God was the farthest thing from my mind. I love to tell people, though, that I was not the farthest thing from His. I stepped onto my university campus, a little school called University of the Pacific in the middle of California that nobody on the side of the country has ever heard of. I stepped onto my, my campus, and there was a ministry on my campus, a ministry called Chi Alpha. And the students of this ministry understood they were not students who just so happened to be Christians, but they were Christians whom God had called to live their faith out loud on the university campus. The students of this ministry did what I think we want folks in our churches to do. They didn't wait for me to go find them. How many of you guys know that I'm an 18-year-old unchristian student? I wasn't looking, you know, I wasn't looking for Christians. You know what I mean? I got on my campus. Let me just say, when I went away to college as a non-Christian student, I was not looking for Christians, all right? But they came and found me. And for over three years, the students of this ministry loved me. They showed me the life of Jesus reflected through their lives. You guys, I had never seen that. I had never seen Jesus' reality reflected through anybody's life that I knew, that I liked, that I was friends with. They loved me, they showed me the life of Jesus, and they prayed. And you guys, these students knew how to pray. They prayed me into the kingdom. It took them three years because I'm a little hard-headed. I like to say that they persisted when I resisted. But after about three years of these uh, the students, their influence in my life, I ended up going to, it was a church in our town that a lot of the Chi Alpha students went to, and as a Civil of God church, I remember going in on a Sunday night, sitting in the back, and, and, and I remember, um, I remember the guy was preaching at the very end, this is the only way I know how to describe it, I, I just, I began to feel what I later learned was the presence of God. Now, I didn't know that's what I was feeling, I just knew something was happening in my life. And the only way I can describe how it was, it was that I, I feel like I feel like something reached inside of me and shook something loose on the inside. And somewhere deep in my heart, I knew God was real. In fact, that night, I heard God speak to me. Now, you've got to understand, I'm from a non-Christian background. I didn't have a theology for the voice of God. To put it simply, I didn't know God could talk. But I heard God whisper to me. He said, Stephanie, I want all of you. I don't want 90%, I don't want 99, I just, I want all of you. I want your whole heart. And I have since learned how reasonable it is of God to ask us for everything. It is so reasonable. He, you know, he never asked us, he would never ask us for something that he wasn't willing to give. If he was going to ask me for my whole heart, it was so reasonable because he had already given me all of himself. And it was also so loving of him and I say it's loving because he knew I would never be satisfied giving half my heart. I don't know if you've ever lived halfway in, halfway out. I don't know if you've ever lived kind of on that, whatever. It's a terrible way to live. 
And some of you guys are working with people now, and you know, you see it, they're, they're trying to do the halfway thing, and you know there's, their heart is miserable, because ultimately we were not made for that. We were made to give him all of our hearts. And so that night I said, yes, God, you can have all of my heart, you can have 100% of me. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer you had no idea what you were praying? You know what I mean? I was like, God, oh, we can have all of me. You know? And then like, God took me up on it. You know what I mean? Oh, wait, I didn't know you meant all of me, you know? I was, at the time I was a senior in college, I was in the process of applying to law school, and I'll tell a little bit of the story over the course of tonight, maybe tomorrow night as well, but in that process of applying to law school, I felt like the Lord was redirecting my heart, and even to the point where I, the very week I got the acceptance letter to a law school I was interested in, God said to me, Stephanie, don't go. And my first thought was something like this, Lord, did you pray about that? <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't ask that. I didn't ask the Lord to pray about it. But really, I mean, at this point, I'm a second semester senior in college, that's not a good time to change your major and not a good time to change your, your, your degree but it was at that point I, I said I had and I will share a little bit about this I, I said God I, I'll do anything you want me to do just tell me what you want me to do and I'll give up law school and the Lord said here's, here's how I want to do it I want you to give up law school first and then I'm going to tell you what I want you to do which so sounds like the Lord really isn't only the Lord who could get away with that in our lives you know and so in that process, I learned to exchange my dreams for my life for his dreams for, for my life. I learned that when you do that, when you exchange your dreams for your life or his dreams for your life, you get the best end of the deal, whatever that is. I mean, I have a good friend who always thought she'd be a youth pastor, raised in the church, she's a PK, she thought she'd be a youth pastor. God called her into law. Whatever it is God has for us, it's the best end of the deal. So in that process, I exchanged my dreams for my life or his dreams for my life, and God called me back to the place where he had given me life, back to the university campus to call students into relationship with him, to call students into the arms of a loving God who's been calling their names just like he called my name. And I've got to say this, I, I, I imagine you guys will get this. I, I share my story some places, and I always feel like I have to qualify what I'm about to say. I have had a blast in the will of God. Is that okay to say? There are times, I, there are some places I go and I almost feel like, you know, I say, I have, I've had a blast in the will of God, and they look at me like, the will of God is supposed to be hard. Or, you know what I mean? Like, what do you mean? You know, I, you know and, and I, I just think, you know, there's, there's enough inherent challenges of life, enough inherent challenges of mystery. I don't know why we got to make it harder than we do, in all reality. You know what I mean? But I have had a blast in the will of God. I love taking students overseas, and it's almost like their eyes get big when they realize Jesus is not an American. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, and seriously, for some people, that is heavy revelation, you know? But, like, he's Lord over all the earth. I remember being in Morocco once, just in the center of one of the cities there, sitting on the little balcony of my, of my hotel, having my devotional time, thinking, Jesus, you really are Lord of all. I love working, I love doing this. I love working with these amazing students who, you know what, right now they're on the campuses. And, and you guys get this if you're working in youth and, and children's ministry. You know what, right now they're on the campuses and, and today they're studying and, the, and tomorrow they'll be the teachers who lead the next generation of children. Today they study, tomorrow they're going to be the ones we go to to mend our bodies. Today they study, tomorrow they're going to be running businesses in our communities. They're going to be governing our communities. They may even be pastoring our churches. And it has been a complete joy to be able to do that. And part of that has led me to work in a chair, and it's just been a joy in that as well. We're going to look tonight at uh, a passage of scripture. And, uh, you know, when I, I often think... Um, Jerry asked me to share and just talk something encouraging for us tonight, and so we're talking about why ministry. Whenever I share my story, it, it stirs back up why I do what I do. It keeps it so completely fresh for me, which is just so much fun. I mean, I don't really have to, I don't have to reach back. I, when, I, when I share with students around the nation and stuff, I don't, I don't have to reach back. I know it's been a number of years, but I don't have to reach too far, really, to remember what it was like to walk on campus without the hope that eventually won my heart. I, I don't really have to think too hard. I don't have to go too, too far back in my mind to be able to recapture the why of what I do. And so I want to talk for a little bit about that tonight with us. Um, in, in a moment, we're going to get into a passage in Psalm, but until then, I just, 
you know, I, I, I think that there's something that's so important about remembering why we do what we do. You know, why is, you know, why are you here? Why are you in youth ministry? Why are you in children's ministry, worship ministry? And I remember, you know, we, we were joking about this earlier. I remember uh, being new to the church. Now, remember, I'm, I'm from a non-Christian background. I was 21 years old when I came into the church. And um, I remember it was like a whole new culture. For me. Anybody coming to the church later, you're welcome, and you're like, why? I don't understand why you do what you do. And I, you know, just, I remember thinking, they sing a lot. <laughs> no, really, I had never sung so much in my life. You know, I really, I was like, everything they do, they start with music, and everybody sings, and everybody sings, but maybe they can't sing. And, you know, and I was like, I, my dad's been in business, my mom's been in business, they've never started a meeting with song. You know what I mean? I didn't, but no one really explained to me why that was. I was still, like, I remember and, and they'd take prayer requests, and like someone would always say, unspoken. And then, every, you know, so many people around the circle, unspoken. And I was like, who's unspoken? And why is everybody praying for that guy? I had no idea what that meant. And, you know, I had, I had no idea. I remember, and this, some of you guys may feel this, I remember when I first came into faith that I was in a community that said, you got to get rid of all your secular music. Okay, this is 1989. Like, I was singing, like, Bette Midler, Wind Beneath My Wings. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was like, why is that? But I didn't know. No one really explained. I was like, that and New Kids on the Block. And, you know. And, um, but part of my own discipleship, part of my own learning to follow Jesus has included how to keep the why fresh. Why we do what we do. Friends, why matters. Why matters. Why motivates. Why we do what we do keeps us motivated. Why sustains us. And as one wise woman said, when you lose your why, you lose your way. When you lose your why, you lose your way. A lady named Gail Hyatt. I think that's just a modern way of saying that without a vision, we cast off restraint. When we lose our why, we lose our way. And if I were the enemy, that's exactly what I would go after. I would go after our why. Why we do what we do. So we're going to look at our why this evening. Why are you in ministry? Why did you say yes? I want to look in the book of Psalms for a moment. I'm going to share a little bit more about how I got into ministry and then kind of reverse engineer that into the why. But if you turn in your Bible, I think we're going to have it up here in a moment. Psalm chapter 14, verse 2. We're going to look at a very small, just one passage of Scripture. Here's one of the things I love about the Word is we're going to look at one passage, but it is power-packed with meaning. That's what I love about the Word. It's living. It's active. It's not, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're, we're going to dig a little bit deep, and there's so much more than what we're going to get into and even what we talk about. But Psalm chapter 14, verse 2 says this. I'm reading out of the uh, English Standard Version. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. The NLT paraphrases it this way. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. I remember reading that passage one time, just in my devotions and just reading it through. I had probably read it a number of times, but you know how sometimes when you're reading something and it's like you're thinking, when did they put that in there? Since the last time I read Psalms, you know what I mean? Like it's almost like the Holy Spirit takes the highlighter of heaven and says, I want you to see this one today. This was like that for me. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race to see if anyone who understands, any who seeks God. And I remember thinking, Lord, if you're looking for someone to seek you, I want you to find me seeking you. God, even if you if you're looking at from heaven. And, and the implication there, it's almost the language is like God's looking down from heaven like passionately. It's not, it's not a passive God who's sitting there, you know, you know, flipping on you know his iPad or something like that. It's a God who's like leaning in, passionate toward. If God is searching, if God is looking to see who would seek him, God, I want you to find me seeking you. Even if when you look down from heaven, if you saw everybody else in the world seeking something else, God, may you find me seeking you. And I thought about that simply because when you love somebody, you just want to do what makes them happy. And I was like, God, I really love you, and I want, to, I want to make you happy. I want you to be pleased when you look down from heaven. I want you to find me seeking you. And I also realized part of the reason I want that is that he sees so many people seeking so many other things. I remember walking on a campus one time, and I was walking on a campus. I heard the guy yell from one of the residence halls, Party! 
He's seeking something. You know what I'm saying? Like, you and I don't have to spend more than 14 seconds walking into our community before we find somebody seeking something other than God, right? But even within the church, even among those of us who are followers of Jesus, it is so easy to find our identity based in what we do versus who he says we are. It's so, it's so easy to find, to, to seek people's approval over the approval of Jesus. It's so easy to find so many things that are lesser than he is. Even among the people of God, it's so easy to find our identity and position and everything. And God is looking for someone who will lift their eyes and seek him and him alone. Well, I'm pretty logical, so I thought, man, if I, you know, what does this mean? If God's looking for someone to seek him, I, I really want to, but what does that mean? Like, how do I know I'm seeking? Like, is it how scrunched my face? Is it the fact that I'm, you know, I'm at a, you know, I attend every meeting, and I'm literally, like, when I first became a Christian, I attended everything. I mean, if they let me in the men's Bible study, I'd have gone, just because I wanted to be, I, I just wanted to be there. I just wanted so much of God. I still remember, I, I think, I found out later, I went to a, a, a student retreat that I found out years later, or I, I suspected years later, I don't think I was actually invited to, I think it was actually a leadership retreat, and I just heard they were going on retreat, so I'm like, I'm going, and I, they had been praying for me so long, I don't think they wanted to say no, you know what I mean, like, well, she's not a leader, but she, well, bring her on anyway, you know what I mean, like, I wanted to be at everything, but is that the definition of seeking? Well, there is a passage in this, uh, in this, or there is a clue in this passage I want to take a look at here. I think it will be encouraging to you. When it says the Lord is looking for someone who will seek him, as we know, this, this passage was written in the Hebrew language. I would love to tell you that I know Hebrew. I do not, but I have a computer who does. And so I study this out. There are several meanings of the, when we see there the word to seek, it has several meanings. The Hebrew ear would have heard several things. We're going to camp on two of them tonight. When it says that God is looking for someone who will seek him, the first definition of that is to frequent. And the second is to tread. To frequent and to tread. Let's camp for a minute on to frequent. Someone tell me, I, here's where, it, you know, it's, it's Thursday night, right? So let's, I'm going to get you guys talking. Someone tell me, what does it mean to frequent? I'm not setting anybody up. Just a little feedback. Well, what does it mean to frequent? Keep going back to it. Say again? Keep going back to it. Keep coming back to it. Excellent. What are places you guys like to frequent? Starbucks. Oh, yeah. But for, what's that? Dunkin' Donuts? Okay. Oh, Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I was telling, I think, who was I telling the other day? Yeah, that pink and orange, it's like Pavlovian for me. You know, when I drive, I'm like, oh, hey, you know. <laughs> donut holes. Yeah. So other places that you guys like to frequent. What's that? Pizza shop. See, I like pizza. I knew I felt right at home here. Right? So far, we got coffee and food. Excellent. Anywhere else? Target. Target. Wait, wait. Hold on. I'm moving here. That's it. Pizza, coffee, and Target. I'm in. Yeah. Anyway, else? Maybe one more? Chick fil A. Yes. Except I primarily want it on Sunday. I don't know. What is that thing? I'm stuck on my bed. It's Sunday. I'm happy that they give their people a chance to worship. You know what I mean? Like, it's every time. Okay, so if you guys get to know me for very long, you will learn that I love, love Mexican food. Like, hardcore love it. Like, truly, truly, I think I am Mexican. You know what I'm saying? I think if you cut me open, I would bleed salsa. I'm not even kidding. Like, I, I have a salsa tank that if it gets low, I start to twitch a little bit. I, I mentioned I grew up in Los Angeles. We've got some really good Mexican food over there. Oh, my goodness. And my family always had our Mexican restaurant. It was, you know, I remember when I was super little, it was the duck place because next door there were some ducks. And then there was, you know, then there was Ernie Tacos. And then there was Pepe's. And then Lupe's. We always had our family Mexican restaurant. And I remember when I left California, there, I, when I first left California, I moved to Missouri for a little bit, and uh, there was this one restaurant in, uh, in where I lived in Missouri, and it was actually pretty good, which I was like, okay, that's hopeful. Now, when I lived in Washington, D.C. for 12 and a half years, painful how bad the Mexican food was there. I don't know if you've ever done it. I went to a place one time, and I walked away actually angry. I'm like, you can't. Call it, you can't use ketchup and call it ranchero sauce. I mean, I was just like totally offended the entire thing. But when I lived in Missouri the first time, there was this great little place, and I would go in every day. I mean, I went there so often that when I would, you know, when I would leave, I'd go there and have my lunch, they'd leave it, say, see you tomorrow, and then would. You know what I mean? Like, I went there so often. 
And you hate to say, I went there so, I went there so often. <laughs> True story, I went there so often the host tried to set me up with his cousin. I'm not, <laughs> not even kidding. Not even kidding. I went there, I've been there so much and, and no, I'm not even kidding. I remember the host was like, You're like Latino man? I'm like, does he have his own salsa? <laughs> All the time. I would get two carne asada tacos and an iced tea for four dollars and two cents. You can't get that at Taco Bell. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember the waitress came and she went to, to set a menu down. She then she saw it was me and she said, You don't need one of these, you know. And and I loved the hot salsa. Now they had the regular one they have, you know, they had mild, they had kind of what they called hot, and then they had the hot stuff in the back. And there was this one sweet lady who bust the tables and she knew I liked the really hot stuff. And so I'd walk in and she'd say, Hot, hot, you know what I mean? And then she'd run in the back and bring out the stuff that's got like smoke coming from the top, you know? I mean, that was like, because my thought is, if your eyes aren't watering and your nose isn't running, it's not good salsa. I mean, you just need the full experience here, right? That's, I, I love it there. So I remember going, I would go in so often, and literally they would call me by name. They knew exactly what I was ordering. To seek means to frequent. And I'm just thinking, when we frequent the Father, because I frequented that place, I frequented that place so much, they called me by name, they knew what I wanted even before I asked. When we frequent the Father, He calls us by name. And He knows the request of our heart before we ever even ask. Let me just ask you, just in terms of keeping it fresh, what are you frequenting lately? What are you frequenting? When you go before the Father, do you feel like He calls you by name? And he knows the request on your heart before you even ask. When I was in that process, I mentioned of trying to process whether I was going to take a uh, you know mid-course correction in terms of my degree. I lived my final year, my senior year of college. I lived off campus. I had lived on campus for three years. Got a little apartment with a good friend of mine. We had a second-story apartment that faced due west. We had a little balcony in our apartment and I had a little hammock on my balcony. And every day as I was processing what I started to feel like maybe Jesus was doing in my life, because I had been so ready for law school, but so hard moving toward law school. And somewhere in there, something started to shift and I just knew I needed to get in the presence of God and begin to process this. So day after day, I'd come home from my classes, go out to the balcony. I had a place that I would frequent. And I would quite literally hang out with God. And as I would hang in my little balcony, I, I we faced, as I said, due west. And part of that view was just an open field. And part of it was an orchard. And it was like the sun set just directly down the center. It was just spectacular. Day after day, I would frequent that place. I'd go there and I would talk to Jesus about what he wanted to do with my life. And I would say, Jesus, I just, I'll do anything you want. Just let me know what you want me to do. Jesus, you have my whole heart. And it was in that place of frequenting the Father that God began to stir the direction of my heart to the call. I knew somewhere in there God was calling me into ministry. I didn't know exactly what. I thought youth ministry, there was a, there was a great internship at my church. I really needed to process that, that he hadn't, he hadn't fully let me know yet. But this takes us to the next thing, to frequent and to tread. I want for just a moment, I want you just to imagine, if you would, imagine... Imagine the throne of God, just as you read in Scripture and as you can use the imagination God's given. Just imagine God seated on His throne. And from the throne of God is rolled a red carpet out to your feet. You know, I mentioned growing up in Los Angeles, we would always have you know, some celebrity or something, they'd roll out the red carpet. Living in D.C., they'd always roll out the red carpet for some kind of VIP. I personally think in the eyes of God, we are VIPs. I think he rolls out the red carpet. I think he rolls it out to our feet. I don't think I don't think the carpet from his end ends at the steps of the throne. I think it goes directly into his heart. And I, I would begin, just figuratively, if you'd give me a little word, figuratively as I would frequent the Father's presence, as I, was, as, I was fre as I would frequent him in prayer, it was like I began to tread a path on that red carpet. And I would literally tell God, you know, uh, God, I just want to wear a path out on this carpet. You know, some of you who are parents of little ones, you know what worn out carpet is like in your house. You know, usually in our house it was toward the kitchen. And I would say, God, I just want to wear out a, a 
just a rut in that carpet toward your heart. I mentioned as I was in process of trying to decide what to do about um, the law career that I had been planning, the Lord asked me to set aside the law, and for the year after I graduated from college, I moved back into a residence hall. Uh, I worked, I applied for a position with my university to be a hall director. They placed me in a, in a building with 70 students. I believe they were all freshmen. Uh, so I'm the hall director over a building of 70 college students on a secular university campus. I, I didn't really know much of anything. I was still pretty young in my faith. I just knew that I wanted God to do in these students what he had done in my life. And I just was like, God, I just, God, this doesn't make sense. I think my salary was, you know, a little tiny apartment and 300 bucks and, you know, a little pass to the dining hall. And, you know, that wasn't exactly what was in my parents' plan for my life. You know what I'm saying? You know, they were, are you kidding me? You know, but I just knew that God had called me to do this thing. So for a year, I lived in this residence hall. When, when I got all the information from the students, when they filled out their cards to their info cards, I found that out of those 70 students, there was one student who claimed to know Jesus. 69 non-Christian students and one young woman who I would say, and I think she would say, she had faith in Jesus, but she had not yet found life in Jesus. She had, she had a faith. She had an intellectual faith in Jesus. I just knew God called me there. And I, I remember saying, God, I, I'm brand new at this. I, I don't really know what I'm doing in terms of evangelism or anything. So I made a deal with God. I said, God, you tell me what to do, and I'll do it. That was my evangelism strategy. God, you tell me what to do, and I'll do it. So little by little, God began to unfold some things. I remember praying with a friend one night after our Chi Alpha meeting. And my friend said, you know, Stephanie, I think, this may sound strange, but I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you to go into the basement of your building and pray. So every night, I would tread a path into the basement of our little building, and I would pray for my students. I, you know, I just, this is where the laundry room was. I'm sure my students thought I had the dirtiest clothes of anywhere, because every night I would tread a path into that little place. Every night. And, and my, my prayer language, not prayer language like in, in tongues, but my language for prayer was really unsophisticated. I would pray. I'd go down there and I, honestly, I didn't know how to pray much other than to say, God, from this basement, like, move up. <laughs> I literally prayed that. I didn't know how else to pray. God, just move up. And when you're moving up, touch people on your way up. And I would just night after night try to path into that basement, pray for my students. About midway through the semester, uh, through the year, I felt like the Lord changed that and said, now I want you to go and I want you just to start walking the halls at night before you, before you go to bed and start praying for your students. So every night, I would come out. My, my apartment was on the first floor. I, I'd walk out of my apartment and I'd walk down the floor and then just quietly, non-weirdly pray for my students, you know? And I just, I knew them all, but at that point we'd all lived together for four months and so I would just quietly pray for my students, then I'd go up to the second floor. Second floor was a men's floor, so I kind of usually had to do this a little bit more, you know? And then I'd go up to the third floor, and it was a woman's floor again, and I would just quietly pray. Every once in a while, I would feel like God would incline me to lay my hand on one of their doors and just ask for a specific touch from them. There were times when the Lord told me things about their lives that they hadn't told me, just as I continued to tread a path to his heart on their behalf. Little by little, things started to happen there. I had asked the Lord that year for a tithe. I said, God, you asked me for a tithe of my money. I'm asking you for a tithe of this building. I said, I want to see seven students get to know you this year. There were days, you guys, it was so discouraging. There were days that I would, you know, I'd want to invite people to stuff, and they came up with the same excuses that I used to use back in the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> Those ones that were like, oh, I think I used that excuse when someone invited me to church once. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't go. i got to wash my cat. You know, I, you know, I got to get a cat so I can wash them. And, you know, and, and I just, there were times I was so discouraged, but I just kept treading. Just kept treading on behalf of my students. I started a little Bible study. In, in that I had introduced it at one of the hall meetings and I said, you guys, I'm going to do a little Bible study. And then I left, the meeting ended and I left and I remember a young woman came running up to me and she said, Stephanie, I'm going to go to your Bible study. She said, I'm a really strong believer. I don't know if I'm Mormon or Catholic or what, but I'm a really strong believer, you know? And I was like, well, then this will be perfect for you, you know? Her name is Julie. Julie was from Hawaii. She's a beautiful Hawaiian girl. Julie was, um, so she, she started coming to the Bible study, and then, like, it was just something just started happening in her life, and it was really cool. And I remember one day on a Saturday, we were going to have this evangelist at our church the next day, and I remember one day the Lord told me, I want you to invite Julie to church. You guys, I was terrified. 
I, I just, you know, for all of the wanting to do whatever God wanted, I was really scared to just kind of take that step of faith out. But I told the Lord I would do whatever he asked me. So I came out of my little apartment and walked, it's, I don't know, maybe 30 or 50 feet. It felt like 30 or 50 miles to get to her room. And I knocked on the door. She opened it, and I said something to the effect of, you want to go to church? Because <laughs> I was so scared I couldn't get the words out, you know? And she said yes. And I remember, uh, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I didn't expect her to say yes. I didn't know what to do then. I was like, I guess I'll take you, <laughs> you know? I took her to church the next day, and Julie beautifully gave her life to Jesus. Like, the kind of gave your life to Jesus that includes, like, all the tears and snot and everything. I mean, Jesus won her heart in a profound way that day. And I remember taking her back saying, I don't know what to do with her now. I don't know how to disciple anybody. I don't know what to do with her. And then I said to the Lord, Lord, whatever you teach me, I'll teach Julie. So that was my discipleship strategy at the time. I remember that night, for some reason, one of my good friends and I decided to watch Jesus of Nazareth in the common room of the dorm all six and a half hours, you know. <laughs> Soon, I, I still don't know why we thought oh, that was a great idea, but you know what? Students started coming in and staying. Julie comes in and she sat down and she's like, now, Julie's about six hours old in her faith at this point. Julie's watching it and she's like, that's right, Jesus, you tell those Pharisees. I don't know what a Pharisee is, but you tell them. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, this is great. Julie, as I mentioned, this beautiful Hawaiian girl was very, very well known in our building. People started to take notice when Julie gave her life to Jesus. Julie was a competitive hula dancer. I had never heard of that in my life, you know? <laughs> Julie was also on the crew team. People just took notice. I mean, they were like, hey, did you hear Julie got saved? Yeah, what does save mean? I don't know, but it looks good on her. I mean, it was just stunning. <laughs> little by little, over the course of the rest of that semester, students started giving their lives to Jesus. On the final semester, or final weekend of the semester, I got a 1 a.m. phone call from Julie. Julie called to tell me she just led this young woman named Wendy to the Lord. Wendy was like the most antagonistic person in our hall. Wendy would come in after our Bible studies. We'd open the door. Wendy would rush in and want to argue with us for like two hours at a time. Like, what about the guy in Africa who's never heard? And, you know, on and on. And I didn't know. I didn't know a lot of answers for her. I just said, we can love her. We can show her Jesus. We can pray. One o'clock in the morning on the final weekend of school, Julie calls. I just led Wendy to Christ. Wendy was the seventh person of that year, God gave me my tithe. Now here's the thing about God. He does immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Because that summer, Julie went home, led her dad to Christ. Wendy went home, led her best friend to Christ. Scott, who was one of the RAs that year, the next September, gave his life to Christ. And a year later, his girlfriend came back to Christ. We counted over the next three years, 25 people from that little spot, that little place, almost actually that little place in the middle of California that you've probably never heard of. God moved in that little spot. And there are people around the world today. I still hear Chad and Shanti. I mean, I remember being with those guys. They are missionaries. Uh, I think they're in Cambodia at this point. I mean, I mean, literally, people have been sent to the nation by that one little spot. Who knows? Who knows what God could do? Who knows what God could do? Friends, that's how ministry started for me. That's how ministry started, frequenting the Father's heart, treading a path to his heart, and then treading, treading a path to the heart of the ones who don't know the way. That's one of the things here. Julie, Chad, Shanti, Wendy, they didn't know the way to the Father's heart. So as a thank you from my life, to Jesus. I said, I just said, Jesus, I'll be happy to tread a path to the people who don't know the way to your heart. It's just, it became real simple for me, guys. I know sometimes we, I don't know, maybe in this world we complicate things. It was real simple. Jesus was willing to tread a path. Jesus was willing to tread a path to a place that I didn't know the way. I mean, I, I just, I've often thought, if the world was waiting for me to go to the cross, they'd still be waiting. We'd be messed up if you were waiting for Stephanie. We'd be messed up. I didn't know the way. Jesus tread a path to Calvary. We know that. He tread a path on behalf of us, and he's asking us to tread a path on the ones who don't know the way. Why ministry? Because I want to be like Jesus. My ministry, because he tread, he, Jesus walked that dusty path, and it would be an honor to walk it with him, and it would be an honor to walk it for him. We're going to pray here in a moment. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come back up and lead us. 
I want my life to be a lifelong thank you to Jesus. I really do. A lifelong thank you to Jesus. I understand that in this context of what we're talking about and who we are here in this place, that is in the context of serving in some ministry capacity. And, and I don't know all of you guys, maybe you have positions that you, maybe you have a, a day job and then, you, and then you serve at your church in another capacity as well. Either, either way, if, if ministry is your full-time calling or part of your calling, either way, our lives are a thank you back to the one who walked that dusty path. Who walked the dusty path because we didn't know the way, who walked the dusty path to show us how to walk the dusty path on behalf of the ones who don't know the way. As a thank you, I said yes, and as a thank you, I keep saying yes. I don't know about you guys, but one yes wasn't enough. One yes wasn't enough. Day after day, I keep saying yes. Day after day. So as the worship team plays, this is what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to take a few moments to respond to Jesus. Here's the thing. I know some of you guys, my guess is some of you are just thinking tired. Just the reality. I was thinking, you know, we... we I know we don't do this a lot in our Protestant circles, um, at least in our in our um, movement as much, but Advent starts on Sunday. Advent is the time that we're supposed to recognize the patient waiting for the Savior. And I don't know about you, but as we come to the end of the calendar year, I don't feel a sense of patient waiting. I feel a sense of like, I don't feel like I want to take a deep breath in my lungs to wait before the Lord. I Sometimes I feel at this point like I, I need to take a deep breath breath in my lungs to get a little more stamina to press through these last few weeks because we've got programs of church and we've got this and we've got that and we've got that. It doesn't feel like a patient waiting. It feels like a rushed hurry. Maybe tonight, though, we can patiently wait before the Lord. Maybe tonight we can say, Jesus, I just want to be with you. Can I just sit at your dusty feet? Can I just sit at your dusty feet? If you feel, if you feel that sense of needing some encouragement, I'm going to encourage you guys to, to spend some time at the dusty feet of Jesus. If you feel like you have been frequenting something or, or, that, or that the busyness of ministry has kept you from frequenting the Father's heart, spend some time with the Father's heart. Amen? Amen. Jesus, we dusty feet of Jesus. God, I pray for the ones who have been laboring and just need some hope and encouragement that what they're doing matters. I pray that as they spend time at the dusty feet of Jesus, you would encourage them, you'd whisper to them, you would lift the burdens. God, I pray for those who feel like Man, my heart is inclined, I feel like I'm not getting that time, I feel like in fact I'm frequenting something else that makes the why of ministry so very hard. God, I pray in the name Jesus, that you would encourage them today, that you would call them today in the name of Jesus. Friends, we're going to have just the worship team play softly for a bit. If you want to just be in your seats, if you want to take a knee somewhere, if you want to ask somebody for prayer, please do that. And in a few moments, they're going to come and lead us in the final song of worship. We will end tonight worshiping Jesus together as part of our thank you.